Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garver. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And I have uh, one of the coolest guests around with Ricky Warwick. Uh, he's smiling and laughing there. I've been a fan of his playing for a long time. Uh, you know, one thing I don't know why it doesn't get mentioned about Ricky is this guy's voice, man. You got like one of the sweetest voices in music now. I mean, like, oh, it, thank you. No, you're welcome. It's like every time I'm listening to you, it's like, holy shit. Anyway, so to pay attention to that when you're listening to, to Ricky's music. Uh, quick announcement. I want to thank our mutual friend, Keith Nelson, for hooking us up. Keith from Buckcherry, of course. Thanks very much. Uh, also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash, forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button down there and a little emoji that looks like a uh, bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. Thank you for that, by the way. Let me tell you about Ricky. Originally from Northern Ireland, he's got a great brogue. Uh, Ricky's a guitarist, songwriter, and singer. Uh, again, to me, he's got one of the best voices in rock and roll now. Uh, in 87, he got a call to join the acclaimed UK punk slash folk band New Model Army as a rhythm guitarist on their 1987 Ghost of Cain world tour. Next, he formed the Almighty, which is a hard rock band with punk influences out of Glasgow, Scotland. The band released 10 top 40 singles and four top 20 albums in the UK, touring worldwide and opening for bands like the Ramones, Motorhead, Megadeth, and Iron Maiden. That must have been cool opening for the Ramones, no? Insane. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Ricky then moved back to Ireland. He became a solo artist, releasing four albums over the next 10 years. In 2010, Ricky got a call from his old friend, guitarist Scott Gorham, who was reforming, reforming Thin Lizzy. He wanted Ricky to sing and play guitar in the new lineup. A couple of years later, members of the then Thin Lizzy formed Black Star Riders, which if you haven't listened to Black Star Riders, man, I think they have four, four albums, Ricky? Four, yeah. Incredible band, man. Just really great, old school, straight ahead rock and roll. Um, Ricky was a front man, rhythm guitarist, and the main songwriter from the band. They've released four records, as we just said. Among them, two UK top 15 albums and one UK top 10 album. In addition to Scott and Ricky, there have been some other great guitarists and Black Star writers, including Damon Johnson and Christian Nortucci, both of whom appeared here on Everyone Loves Guitar a while back. In total, Ricky's released a dozen albums with the Almighty, four albums with Black Star writers, and nine solo albums, including his most recent, which is called When Life Was Hard and Fast, produced by Keith Nelson, again, guitarist and founder of Buck Cherry. Dude, you've got a big, this is like, you think you, you'd be you like, make, you, you, I'm, you're listening to that and I go, go, people must think I'm 110 years old. Yeah, that's, what, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I'm like, shit, this is like three careers in one. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, I'll be very blessed. I mean, 40, I guess almost 35 years as a professional musician, which is incredible. Um, you know, you never, you never dream, you, you know, you, you're always thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if we get to play the marquee in London? Wouldn't it be great if we get to make a record? But to be able to say that I've been doing this, you know, uh, for, for as long as I have is, uh, is wonderful, far beyond my wildest expectations. <laughs> Well, man, it goes with talent and work ethic, which we'll talk about, because this is a lot of work involved here. I mean, this isn't like, you know, sure. falling off a log. This is a lot of deliberate motion. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, you grew up in Northern Ireland. Where did you grow up and what was that area like? And maybe what was your childhood like overall? Um, I grew up in a town called Newton Arts, uh, spelled N-E-W-T-O-W-N-A-R-D-S, Newton Arts, and it's in County Down, and it's about eight miles east of Belfast. Okay. Um, so pretty much out in the sticks. Um, I grew up on a small farm. My, my, my father was, was a farmer. We had a small farm there. Um, and then I, I, grew, I stayed there till I was just before my 15th birthday, and then we re relocated to Scotland. What prompted that? Um, um, well, you know, I think that I was being the only son, I was going to go into the farm when I left school. There was a chance to buy a little bit more land in Scotland and also to get away from the situation that was at its height in Northern Ireland at that, at that, at that moment in time. I think my, my, my dad saw a better future for, for everybody. Um, but I, you asked what it's like growing up in Northern Ireland. It, it was, you know, it wasn't weird because when you're born into something, you don't know that it's any different. So if you're born into soldiers on the street, Bombs going off, curfews, barricades, uh, intimidation, strikes, paramilitary violence. That's your life. Yeah. Because you don't know any different. So you make the best of, you're just like, hey, that's where I live. That's what it's like here. And then, you know, 
it's only when you travel in later life that it really hits you and you go, oh, my God, you know, that was a dead guy that we had to walk around on the way to school that morning. You know, that, that, that's when you start to freak out because you see that other places in the world maybe aren't like that. Sadly, there's quite a few places that are, but, you know, yeah, you move to the UK, other parts of the UK, and, you know, that, that situation wasn't going on. But where I grew up was fairly sheltered from it being like a, like a little sort of, you know, town in the sticks. We could hear the bombs going off in Belfast because Belfast is down at sea level in the valley, we were up high. New Nards is a town that's kind of up, up high in, in the hills. So if a bomb went off in Belfast, it would resonate up. Holy and you could really, really hear it. Um, you know, and going into Belfast was just, was, was a trip because it was like, you know, it's, I could describe it like, you know, like, it was like Beirut, you know, there was, there was roadblocks with soldiers everywhere. You, you had to get, you know, going into stores, you had, you had to get all your stuff searched. You know, you know, if you, if you're carrying a bag of any, any, kind that had to be opened up like going through airport security it was like that there's restrictions everywhere there's certain parts of town you couldn't go to if you were a certain religion there was certain places you wouldn't want to be caught out at night um on your own and um, there's just certain places you wouldn't walk through uh, again if you were of a certain it was crazy you know and people are northern Irish people are, the, the insane thing about us northern Irish people are one of the most humble friendly and down-to-earth race of people that you can meet and they've got an insane, sarcastic sense of humor. And I think that's what kept the country going, it, is that that whole thing. Um, uh, you know, we were starved. We were starved. You know, it, there was nothing. There was no McDonald's. There wasn't the first McDonald's. Not that I'm advocating going to McDonald's. <laughs> Let's be honest. It, it's, it's shit. But I'm just saying, you know, if you're kids, that's where kids yeah. hang out. First McDonald's didn't open in Belfast until 1994. People used oh. to drive. People were driving 100 miles from Belfast to Dublin to get a fucking McDonald's. Oh my God! You know, so everywhere was closed on a Sunday because you've got, you know, the the the, the Presbyterian Protestant side of it are so strict. They even chain chain the swings up in parks on Sundays, so the kids can use them. Shit! You know, and then the other side, obviously, you've, you've got you know the Roman Catholics with their restrictions as well. So, yeah, it was uh, there wasn't a lot to do. You know, I'm lucky I grew up on a farm because I could just walk out the door and I had all this great great fields and a little motocross bike and i'd just go off in that for, for four hours and all day on that bike and just just ride and you know and, and play soccer with my buddies but there wasn't a lot there was no entertainment and you know getting back to music we were starved of bands because a lot of bands obviously didn't want to come and play because of what was going on so when a, it's kind of funny when a band did come and play like a band like say you get a fleetwood mac coming and playing Every kid would go and see them, whether they were a punk rocker, a mod, or, or, or like, you know, a new romantic. doesn't matter. There's a band playing. Let's go see them. We're getting a, a proper international band. But the great thing about all this was that we, we suddenly had this influx of amazing Irish bands who were playing and who gravitated, who we gravitated to, who gave us all hope because these Irish bands, like you two, like Thin Lizzy, Obviously, Van Morrison being very successful for years. Like, and then the whole punk thing really kicked off in Belfast around 79, 80 with bands like Stiffle Fingers, The Undertones, you know, Rudy, Outcast, Defects. And they gave us all hope as kids because, all right, they're from here, but they're getting played by John Peel on, on BBC Radio 1 and they're playing in the UK and they're playing in Germany. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can, you know, they gave us hope as kids, you know? That's right. but, I mean, let me ask you this. I don't usually get this deep on question two, but... When Sorry, you... <laughs> it's, a, it's a loaded. Northern Ireland's a loaded question. I could, you know, you could, we could do a whole podcast about that, Craig. You know, no, well, it's so interesting. So my question is: When you grow up in a situation, anytime you grow up in any kind of, I'm going to use the word damaged because it's yeah. it's a damaged childhood to some extent, right? Sure. Um, anytime you have damage, it informs your choices later on. Sure. So, so like if you grow up in a place where you know parent you have bad parents for example then you're not trusting of relationships so you grow up in this like war-torn place where you had to look over your back to some extent how did that impact you later once you because nobody comes and says hey you don't have to worry about anything anymore because you still have that right. that right. clock ticking right in well let me let me sort of preempt this by saying i had a great childhood right i never i never felt threatened and my dad was amazing i never felt scared i felt it was a couple of, a couple of instances but on the whole you know i was insanely close to my father um you know um so i've i've got nothing to gripe about i've gotten to always really you know it really screwed me up and it really you know messed with my head 
I don't, I honestly don't think that it did. Okay. You know, I was a loner as a kid. I, I had two older sisters who, the youngest oldest one's eight years older than me. So it was, it was quite a big age gap there. Sure. I was very much a loner and a dreamer. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm, was quite content with my own company and I would just take myself off and, and, and like I said, get my motocross bike and disappear for hours. So I don't feel that psychologically I, I can look back and go, well, that's the reason that blah, blah, blah. But what I did learn and what I think it taught me was the stupidity of organized religion, the stupidity of racism, the stupidity of not being tolerant with people and not listening to people and understanding their, their points of view and, and what has affected them because everybody's got a story to tell. And I think that's what it taught me. Um, you know, the religious thing was so horrific. You know, it was, you know, we, we, as kids in school, they literally would put the fear of God into you. <laughs> you know, you do not read your Bible, you're going to hell. You do not go to Sunday school, you're going to hell. You'll burn in damnation. Six, seven-year-old kid, I was fucking terrified. That's <laughs> so wrong. And then you're supposed to worship that this guy. And yeah, you know, and I think... <laughs> For help. But, but I think, luckily, I think I was smart enough to go, okay, this can't be right. So I'm going to do my own research on this. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, find out what's going on here. Cause this, this doesn't seem right. Right. This doesn't seem, this doesn't seem right that this guy wants to beat up this guy who looks kind of exactly the same as him because he versus a slightly different version of the same God. Right. 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 You know, obviously yeah. this is, this is, this is bollocks. This is, this is bullshit. So I think a lot of that, the religious bigotry, absolutely. Um, you know tolerance you know i mean you know even moving to west of scotland as well which doesn't have the really the violence but the religious bigotry was still rife in the west i was i was I remember joking with my dad i was like really you, you, you couldn't have moved this to anywhere else you moved this out of one country <laughs> to the west of scotland that's still it's still as as, 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 as bigoted as, as northern, northern ireland is okay it doesn't have the bombs and stuff going off but you know yeah. they have glass they have the, the big soccer thing with glasgow rangers and glasgow celtic it, it tends hatred all based on religion Wow. So stuff like that really got to me, Craig. Um, but escapism for me was music from a really, really early age. And and, and I, I became obsessed with it really, really young. And that music and soccer were the two things that I just was, if I was doing one, one of those, I was oblivious to what was going on. Man, thank you. That was a, that's one of the best five minutes in 800 and something episodes, man. Thank you. That <laughs> oh, was man, really cool. You. That was cool. Awesome. Thanks, man. Uh, so let's talk, let's make perfect transition at 13. You get your first guitar using money you save from your paper route. Yep. Uh, in your bio, you mentioned this, this is pretty cool. So I wrote it down that cheap electric guitar changed my life. It saved me. It was more than just notes on a fretboard. It was, this is heavy. It was the deepest breath of life I ever experienced. Fuck. That's talk about that, man. That's like, <laughs> That's pretty cool. You should be a songwriter, man. Oh, uh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh man, I, I, I still wish I had that guitar. I was, it was a Westbury electric guitar, Japanese guitar. And they're going, they're going, I think I paid 125 pounds for it. I think they're going on eBay now for like almost a grand. You know what I That's mean? It's a lot of money back then. 125 yeah. pounds. It was, it was yeah. a pretty decent, it was a pretty decent first guitar. It was a Westbury guitar and I got a little five watt box practice amp. I'm plugged it in and, and that was it. You know, I, I was, I was changed forever and it changed me forever because suddenly it gave me a confidence that I didn't have. Um, I don't know why it just did. I just suddenly felt empowered and, and I felt that anything was possible. And as soon as, like I said, I put that guitar on, I, I was a different person. And I still am to this day. Um, right. You know, we were joking the other day when we were, we were talking before this and uh, you were sort of saying, you see all these pictures of me and you were wondering what I was going to be like when I put that guitar on before I go on, but I don't have that guitar on. I'm how I am now. As soon as I put that guitar on, I'm no longer on stage. I become a different person. There's a different side of me comes out. And I love that. I love that about the guitar and what that gives me. And that hasn't changed in 40 odd years. That's awesome. As soon as I put man. that guitar on, I go to a different place. There's a different part of my personality that comes out that isn't there already. And, and that's the magic of it for me. And that's the beauty awesome, of it. man. I'll, let me just to inform the listeners what Ricky was saying when we spoke last week. We would try to set this up last week that the just the connection wasn't good. And I was asking him. I said, you know, I see all these pictures of you. You've got like a scowl on your face, or he's like got his fingers up. And I every time I've talked to him, he's he's just been like the nicest, lovely, like 
kind like human being like i'd invite him out to dinner with my wife without you know without even <laughs> knowing anymore and i'm like what's up here and so that's what he was talking about because it was it's a big it is a big dichotomy that you could like yeah you become the stage performer yeah and it and you just you nailed it it's a performance it's entertainment yeah you know i'm going out there to entertain people and give people something uh that they've paid money to see and I don't want to let them down and give them a good time and, and bring them into to the, the vibe and, and the whole situation. And it's like, a, it's a sport. It's like, I leave, I don't leave anything behind. You know, I, it's all out there. I, you know, I play those shows. You get, I bear my soul that yeah. you're getting, you know, from, from the very bottom of my gut, you're getting everything. And if I haven't done that, then I feel I haven't done, done a good job. And that's just, just the way that it is. You know, it's always been that way. Well, I think that speaks right there a lot to your work ethic of your mindset is I'm in the service business. This isn't about me. This is about yeah. I'm entertaining you and I need to give you everything I have. So right then and there, that's part of your longevity for 40 years here, man. Thank for you. For sure. Oh, God. Yeah, that's some that's a treasure, man. Uh, OK. How did you first get started? I know we talked about the early bands. What was your first? So you're playing guitar, you're living on the farm how did you first get started in the music business and what was your first break um yeah again i, I gotta gotta go back a little bit so i started playing you know i had a right before we moved to scotland and left ireland i had i was starting to play with a kid kid down the street a drum kit we were starting to jam and i literally knew like two chords i think i knew a and g and we were just trying to do what we did and then we up sticks and we moved and the first I, I went to high school, I did one year, I had one year left of high school to do. And I went to high school in Scotland. And the, the very first day in school, this is a new kid. He's from Belfast in Ireland. He's got a funny accent. Oh. You know, it, it goes around. So you're in the playground. And and this guy approaches me and he's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, I've got my fist ready. I'm thinking, here we go. This is about, <laughs> the, you know, about to kick off. And uh, he goes, oh, I've got a drum kit. You know, and he goes, this guy here, he's got a bass guitar. And I heard you've got an electric guitar. Come over to my house, you know, after school. Oh, this that's first, cool. This is on the first day. And you suddenly I'm, you know, the very first day I'm in, you know, these kids I just met, I'm in, in somebody's front room, the drum set up and we're, and we're jamming. And then another guy that's got a guitar turns up and he says, do you know how to play bar chords? And I went, no. And he shows me bar chords. Oh, so cool. Bar chords. Those two guys, the guy with the drum kit and the, the bass player, Drummer was Stumpy, and the bass player was Floyd, who I would end up forming the Almighty with. Oh, God. Wow. So first Scotland day school, ain't so bad, huh? School, Scotland ain't so bad. First day of school, 14, just before my 15th birthday, I meet those guys. and That's great. We start a band straight away, right, right, right out the gate. And we start you know, playing covers, and nobody wants to sing. Nobody wants to sing, right? Everybody's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm not, not singing. We couldn't find anybody to sing. And I just turned around and I said, look, here's the deal, guys. I'll do it until we find somebody. But I'm only doing it until we find somebody. It's 40 fucking years later. I'm still looking for somebody to sing. Right? <laughs> so, um, ah, right and we, st we start playing youth clubs, <laughs> youth clubs and school discos, you know, changing the name of the band every week. And then 19 years of age and I've done some demos and, and you know, we're starting, we're playing quite a bit at this point And, I'm playing a little band called Rough Charm, which is a terrible name, like a little old sort of almost 60s garagey sort of like the Sonics and and and, and the spot like Alice Cooper's first band, real garagey punk band, good little band. And we end up getting some shows in New Model Army, who I'm at that point in time I'm a massive fan of. They're, they're probably my favorite band at, at that current moment in time. And they're they're happening, they're really starting to happen. So we end up opening for New Model Army. Their management starts taking an interest in us as well. But during that tour, Justin Sullivan, the lead singer, says, hey, you know, I know you're a fan. Uh, we, would you like to get up and play extra guitar and a couple of tracks during our set? We really need an extra guitar in these songs. Of course, I'm like, fuck, you know, of course, <laughs> yeah. try, try stopping me. Yeah. So um, every night on a tour, I would get up and play a couple of songs. And it was amazing. It was unbelievable. And, you know, that tour finishes, we go back home. I go back to the farm. Everybody goes back to doing what they're doing. You know, the huge sort of buzz come down from our, being our first ever proper proper tour about four days later the phone goes and justin's like you got a passport and i went no i said but uh, i i go to the post office and get one get an emergency one he said yeah you, you better he said because uh 
you know, we've got a world tour starting and I really need you to want you to come and play guitar for new model army. Oh my God. And, and this is a true story. And I went to the post office and got the emergency passport. I was on a plane to Hamburg, Germany to play the very famous club there called the Mark Tala, learning the songs on the plane as I went. And the first show was at the Mark Tala. The second show was um, in front of the Reichstag in Berlin in front of 85,000 people opening for David Bowie. Holy, your second show. My second show. Fuck. No, fucking six Fuck. days earlier, six days earlier, I was driving a tractor plowing a field. That's awesome. That is like such a yeah. good story, man. Yeah, so that was my second show with New Model Army. And uh, I was with them for a year and we toured everywhere. We did seven weeks in America. We toured all over Europe, uh, all of, obviously the UK. And... You know, it, I just was soaking it all in. I was the sponge. I Justin was um, um, still is, he still is a very good friend to me, but you know, a hero to me. Great front man, amazing songwriter, really unique guitar player, and doesn't play by the rules, which I really picked up on and learned a lot from that. So I'm soaking all this in and going, this is just the best time ever. And then the tour finished, and the, they wanted to, they were going in the studio to to do the next record. And Justin pulled me aside and said, look, you know, the, the core of the band is, is the three of us. We're going to go in. We're going to write the next record. You know, you're not going to be a part of that. But as soon as it's done, we hit the road. You're there. So you were like a sideman for them, effectively. Yeah, I mean, I was a member, but I just wasn't, I didn't get to play on any any, any records. And I, listen, I was just, I, if I'd got to do one show with them, crazy. Yeah, like, right. Wow, that was, I wasn't, I wasn't being, you know. But during that time on that tour, I, was think you know I'm always thinking about my next move and I thought you know I knew this wasn't going on I, I knew it was coming I knew that I thought I want to you know I'm going to have to get my own thing going and I've learned a lot from it it made me anxious to want to be a front man again and, and and have my own band so I came up with the name of the almighty while I was out with New Model I, mean, I came up with the concept of, of the band and all that so when Justin pulled me aside and said hey you're not going to be involved uh, in a recording I went it's been amazing it's the best experience. I thank you for everything you've given me and the opportunities you've given me, but I'm going to go and do this. Wow. And, so that took a lot of yeah. confidence, man. I think it did. Looking back, yeah. A Hell lot yeah. Of, a, lot of, a lot of stupidity. Yeah. No, <laughs> but I mean, no, a lot of, I mean, you need a lot of balls. You got a steady gig versus, yeah. you know, the known versus the unknown, right? Well, yeah, but I, you know, I knew it was going to be, I just had an incredible year. I, I, knew, I knew I could probably get another incredible year, but I would be another year older. And who's to say at the end of that, it would be, you know, at some point I, I was, I, I guess I realized I was going to have to go, Hey, I need more. You know, I, I want to write songs because that's what I do. That's what I did before I was in all the bands I was in. I want to sing because I was singing all about, you know, so I realized that that's really what inspired me. So yeah, you know, it wasn't a tough decision to make because I'd already formulated what I wanted to do. I went back home to Scotland. I called up Stump and Floyd, and they, within the rights, could have told me to go and get fucking stuffed because I basically dumped them to join New Model Army for a year. Right. But them being my my friends since we were at school, heard me out and heard out my ideas and said, "All right, you know, as long as you don't sort of fuck off and leave us again, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll 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 do this with you." And we started. We did up a barn in my old my old man's farm. You know, we did the old egg cartons and the whole thing, and. We started rehearsing as the Almighty. We started off as a three-piece and uh, started right. I, I brought in the ideas and the songs I had, and we started jamming on on that was in January, nineteen eighty-eight. Was your dad cool with all this, or was like, is he disappointed? My dad, she, yeah. my dad was amazing. My dad That's was great. My dad was my hero. My dad was my biggest ally, biggest supporter, um, a hard man. My dad, if he saw that I would. He knew how hard I wanted it and how and, and how much I wanted it and how hard I worked at it. Yeah. If it had been anything else, he'd have been on my case going, There's a farm to run here. Because I was the only son. Yeah. So, you know, the, the farm the buck stopped with me. I was the only one to keep, keep sort of farming lengthy going. But we were broke. It was a small farm. My dad was a fantastic farmer, a terrible businessman. Yeah. My dad loved farming the way I love music. Yeah. He wasn't interested in the money. He was just passionate about being a farmer. He was up every day at 5 30. Oh, he was just I didn't have that. I had that about music. And he saw that in me. He knew he knew that I was never going to cut it as a fucking farmer. You know, he, yeah. he wasn't he was but he saw how passionate I was. So he sort of encouraged it. He sort of said, Yeah, you know, I'm gonna give you a couple of years to try and make this happen. 
you know, and then if it, if it hasn't after, you know, then we'll reevaluate. But never put any pressure on, on me to sort of say, no, farm comes first, blah, blah, blah. Never. That's you know, great. Which was, ama- which was amazing. Um, yeah. You know, so I owe him a lot. And, and he, was, he was a great guy. And, you know, when we were successful, he would come to all the shows and hang out. And he was just great. So, yeah. I, and we just started rehearsing. And then, we, you know, we decided pretty soon that we needed to, to achieve the sound that we wanted. We needed an extra guitar player. And that's where we got in touch with Tantrum, who, who was in Glasgow, and he came in and became the fourth member of the Almighty. Very cool, man. That's a great story. And Thank you. You, you had a, a – I love this line, uh, 80 – you have some – you've only started this. you got a bunch of good ones. 85,000 people opening for Bowie. Six days earlier, I was plowing a field. <laughs> I don't know if that's my favorite one or 40 years later, I'm still looking for a singer. Yeah, that was, that was some good ones already, man. Uh, Thanks, man. You, you wound up – after the Almighty, you wound back going to Ireland and you started yeah. your solo career. You released Tattoos and Alibis in 2003. What prompted you to move back to Ireland and what motivated you to say, hey, I'm, this is going to be about me now? Because, again, that took courage and confidence. Um, the Almighty had ended way I was very angry. I was very angry at the music industry because of, you know, you've heard this a hundred times from artists and it's cheesy, but it's true that, you know, the record company people being fired or being let down or, you know, promises not being kept. And I, I was, I'd had it up to here. We'd be, we'd certainly had a fair share of that with the almighty. Um, I wanted to get out of London. I just, I was going through a, a very messy divorce oh, at the time. And, 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 uh, you know, and my head wasn't in a good place and I was doing way too many fucking drugs, way too many drugs. And I, a buddy of mine called Andy Cairns, he plays in a great band called Therapy. He's from also from Northern Ireland. We've been mates for years. He said, come on over to Dublin, um, you know, and, and, and hang out with me and, and, and just fucking get your head together and chill for a while. Um, so I moved, to, I moved to Dublin, ended up doing more drugs. <laughs> than, I was, than, I, than I was in London. Get your head together. I formed, I, formed, I, formed, I formed a punk band called Sick, a three-piece punk band called Sick. We recorded an album uh, which came out in Japan. We recorded an EP which came out in the UK. We were being touted by the NME as the next big thing. We had a deal on the table from MCA in so much as that we played a London show. Our manager brought the contract down. We were due to sign it on the Monday morning. We got the call on the Monday morning. Uh, deals off the guy who signed you the guy who signed you has been fired and uh, there's no deal so this that, that was the last straw for me Craig I was like I can't do this anymore yeah I'm a mess I'm broke I'm thir- 30 years old I have no ma- you know management I have no management I have no record deal I have no publishing deal and I'm doing way too many drugs I need to, you know, and I just, I had a relationship and my, 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 my first daughter was born. Um, and I just went, this is bullshit. You know, you, you have got your, you've got your, you know, I was blaming, like I said, blaming record company. And then, and then suddenly the penny dropped one day and I went, you know what, Ricky, it's not, it's not, this is your fault. This is nothing to do with anybody else. You've got yourself in this situation by agreeing to things you shouldn't have agreed with, by not looking after yourself, by hanging out with people that are a bad influence on you that you shouldn't be hanging. This is all your fault, man. Don't start blaming anybody else for the situation that you're in. You need to fucking fix this. And this is a this is this is another true story. I there was a great there's a great gym in Dublin called Pat Henry's and it's run by Pat, who's a fantastic guy. It's a small gym, nothing fancy, but he anybody who's in an entertainment will go there and train. It's a tiny basement gym in Dublin. And somebody said, and I thought, I was talking to somebody, I said, look, I'm going to get myself back in shape. I'm going to, I need to sort, go and see Pat. I went and saw Pat Henry. And Pat says, yeah, no problem. I said, Pat, I, I, I don't have any money. It doesn't matter. I said, just, just train for a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. So I start training in this gym. I haven't touched the guitar in a couple of months. And Pat says to me, I kind of need somebody to, you know, look after the gym at night. We, do you mind looking after the desk? You know, I'll pay you cash. No, I was like, yeah, no problem. Of course, man, I'd be happy to. You've been so good to me. And then he says to me, you know, you seem to get on okay with people. Why don't you become a personal trainer? 
and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm nothing else going on. I'm done with music. Right. And he pays for me to go and become a personal trainer. I, I qualify, I pass the tests. And he says, right, you start on Monday in the gym. And I'm going, great. This is my new life. This is my new career. This is going to be wonderful. Meanwhile, my gut's going, you're an idiot. You're a rock and roller. <laughs> you, 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 it's born in your blood. Stop denying what you were born to do and what you love. This is just the ruse, you know, but I'm, I'm kind of ignoring, I'm ignoring my gut and going, no, I'm going to do this. This is blah, blah, blah. So I start also, working the also in fairness to yourself at that time, you, you needed a transition. You needed to fucking clean up. And that was a I needed perfect, to clean my shit up. Yeah. that was it, it, perfect. It, 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 Everything that yes, you know happens for a reason, and, yeah. and and I owe Pat a, a a great, you know, a great debt of thanks for 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 what he did for me. And I start working on Monday, and I'm in the gym, and this guy comes in, and he keeps staring at me, and I'm like, "What the fuck's this guy? Pro What's this guy's problem? You know, I'm a fucking <laughs> first time. I'm, I'm going to have to deal with this." And he walks <laughs> over to he walks over to me, and he's like, "Yuri, are you by any chance Ricky Warwick?" And I went, "Yes, I am." He went. I used to work for Polydor Records that your old man, the Almighty, was signed to. I now work for Peer Publishing. Um, I, you know, I'm the representative here in Ireland. He said, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm, I'm done with music. I said, you know, I'm working full time here. He goes, what about the Almighty Catalog? Who who owns that? And I said, well, funnily enough, it just, it just reverted back to me. I actually got a letter about two weeks ago saying that, you know, the publishing deal's up. And so I said, I own the song. He said, look, I'd be interested in, in licensing the catalog do you have anything else have you written anything else i went i went man i said i'm kind of really dumb with music i said i don't really haven't picked the guitar up in about three or four months i said i wrote one song on the acoustic guitar i said it's, it's very different to the almighty very different than anything i've ever done i said you're welcome to hear it but you know i'm this is where i'm at man he went okay i said he said i'll be in tomorrow i said okay i'll bring you i'll bring you the tape in this is like you know 97 so we're still using cassettes or cds or whatever so I bring him the song in, I went hand it to him the next day. And he says, look, I'll be in, I'll be in Thursday. I'll let you know what I think and, and let you know if I'm interested in the, in the Almighty's back catalog. So Thursday comes, he comes into the gym. He goes, because that song's fucking great. He says, it's really, really cool. He said, why don't you do more of this? I was like, ah, I don't know. I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, look, hands me a piece of paper. Here's the offer for that song. And here's the offer for the Almighty's back catalog. And basically, it was a year of uh, it would have been what I would have made in the gym in a year. Wow! Right there, and I signed a contract on the Friday and was back in the music quit business and quit quit the gym that Friday afternoon. Wow! <laughs> Holy shit! That's man. So that's a uh, man. You got great stories here. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, what was what was the I don't want to say bottom, but what was the trigger that made you say, look, I fucked up. I got, yeah, I got the record company and this one in my divorce. And, and I know divorce sucks because I've been through one. Um, yeah. But something happened that you said, this is on me and therefore well, I, I think, can fix it. I think having my daughter and luckily I had, I had a huge collection of guitars and I was selling a guitar literally every other week to pay my alimony for, for, for my kid. <sighs> Um, and and I didn't mind doing that because I do anything for my kid. I mean, she's she's about to turn twenty four, and I've supported her from day one. Never missed an, and I'm proud of that. We have a fantastic relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and and I think that the realization that I was just going down a dark road. You know, I looked like shit. I felt like shit. Nothing seemed to be going right. Um. But, you know, people like Pat Henry and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a big a, a big player at this point in time is Joe Elliott. I've become friends with Joe from Def Leppard. Right. Because Joe, I'd met Joe um, at, uh, you know, in Dublin because he lived there and he was an almighty fan. And, you know, and, he, and we hit it off straight away. Hmm. And he is one of my best friends to this day. And he was sort of, just like, what are you doing? You need to be making music. You need to, you know, Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I've got a great story. I went out in Dublin one night with Joe Elliott, Ian McClagan, and Ronnie Wood. Oh, my story. God. <laughs> in Dublin one night, drinking, partying, doing what you do with these guys. I had 50 cents in my pocket. <laughs> Ronnie Wood's, I didn't pay for anything all night, obviously. Ronnie Wood's limo dropped me off where I lived. It's an area of Dublin called Ring's End. 
And I got out of the limo at nine o'clock in the morning, out of my fucking mind, and went straight into the post office to get my unemployment check. <laughs> That's great. That's classic, man. There you go. I think I think just that. And then, you know, when as soon as I got the published money and Joe called up, he went, right, we're going in the studio. We're making a record. You're going to, those acoustic ideas that you've got, we're going to finish them and we're going to make a record. Yeah. And I, and I went, I can't, there's not enough here. I said, I need to live on this. Said, he said, don't worry about it. We'll make a record. We'll get a deal. Then you can pay me back for the studio. But oh, this is cool. what we're doing. This is what we're doing. It. This is we're doing it right now. I'm producing it. You're going to sing. You're not going to shout. We're going to go at it from a different angle. You know, and and fucking punch me in the face, pretty much, and went, wake the fuck up. Yeah. Do what you do. What you're supposed to do, and do what you love. And I think a combination of all that went right. I just need to get my shit together. I need to stop feeling bitter. I need to stop being angry. I need to, you know, it was just the penny just dropped. Yeah. Good for you. That was good. What he did too, because he kept you hungry he kept some he made you have some skin in the game where you got to pay pay me back for this so that kind of kept you oh, hungry. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. a smart you know smart thing to do no it wasn't like oh don't worry about it i'm joe elliott it's no you know joe joe's like myself blue collar working class right he's very much like in the pub it's your round not like hey i'm, I'm buying drinks all night no 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 it's your round you get him in yeah and, and joe and i love that about joe he's very much no no we'll we'll use my studio and blah 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 we're going to get a record deal and we get the record deal. You pay, and that's what happened. Yeah. You know, that's exactly what happened. You know, I got a record deal for tattoos and alibis and, you know, I wrote Joe a check for, for the studio. Um, and, you know, but he again was a big ally. You know, I can't, I can't, I can turn around and say the penny dropped and I did it all on my own and blah, but I didn't, you know, I, 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 I had some very good friends that were very supportive and didn't, didn't bullshit me. Yeah. You know, you need to fucking wise up and stop being, stop being an asshole, basically, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, those because are the best friends to have, man. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When things like this happen, like, so you had some like external forces, you had Pat Henry, Joe Elliott, your dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of these things came, uh, the guy from, um, that took you out. Pure, the, pure, yeah. Pure music. Yeah. From peer music. And then the guy in, in the, um, the, the sorry, the band that you toured with, he said, Hey, we need you to come on tour with us. You have a passport. Go to yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Justin, Justin Sullivan from New Model Army. Yeah. Right. Sorry. So these guys were like pretty, very critical in each of their own way. How do you look at that stuff? Do you look at it as just right place, right time that someone's looking out for you? Or like, what is, if you have any viewpoint on, or maybe just take it as it go one day, one day at a time, you know, which is also. Uh, I just think, I just think you never, you, you know, you can't kid yourself. I think that that's a realization that, you know, whatever is, is really inside of you and you try and suppress that with me, it was not wanting to play rock and roll anymore. I'm in love with rock and roll. I have been since I was six years old. To suppress that was the wrong thing because that was the thing that was making me who I am. And that's the thing that should have given me hope. Yeah, I got, there was a bad rap from labels and letting you down, stuff like that. But guess what? That's life. Yeah, man. That happens. And, you know, and when I realized that, that's when things infinitely started getting better. Right. You know, I did a lot of self help. I started, I mean, I started really getting into looking after myself. You know, I'm not going to turn around and say, I suddenly went clean and gave up drugs, drugs and drink. I didn't, but I certainly dialed it back. I mean, sure. I haven't done drugs now in fucking 15, 16 years. I still enjoy a drink occasionally. Sure. But I, I knew that I had, had to wise up. And, um, you know, I, I had had somebody else to think about now and, and, and my first daughter and people were, you know, she was depending on me and, and I didn't want to fucking let her down because, you know, I, I, I was very blessed with having such a great relationship with my dad. I certainly couldn't turn around to be be the father that wasn't there for, for my own yeah. kid. That was something that was never, was never ever conceivable. Many factors, Craig, you know, and I just think, again, the work ethic and the fact that I'd done all, I had the success that I had with the almighty and everything that, that had gone before. And it didn't bother me in the slightest that I would, I would begin up at five 30 and driving a van around Dublin, delivering the health food products from, from the gym to, sure. to corporate, corporate offices and things like that are great. Again, that people go, that must've been terrible. You know, you're driving a back, driving a van around Dublin. And then I said, you know what? See the characters I met driving that van at six o'clock, seven, six 30 in the morning. You know, the doorman, the, the cool guys, the, the the jokes and the patter. 
I got to know Dublin like the back the, the back of my hands, you know, little side streets. I went, it was incredible. I went, that was a game changer. Yeah. You know, you know, the fact that I, and, and I put as much, you know, again, a lot of self-help. I'm a huge fan of Muhammad Ali and I love his quote about being the garbage man. You know, what is, I haven't if I had to be quote. a garbage man, I mean, he basically just said, if, if I've got to, you know, if I've got to be a garbage man, I'm going to be the best damn garbage man there ever was. Right on. Yeah. And that yeah. stuck with me. So I put as much passion into driving that van as I would, you know, lead singer. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I learned that. I learned that. I learned to look at it. It wasn't like, oh shit, I'm fucking driving a van around Dublin. It's like, all right, I'm going to get to know the city and, you know, I'm going to get to see George and, you know, out there he's always a good joke and he always stinks of whiskey at six o'clock in the morning, but he never looks <laughs> drunk. And I want to know how that, that works. <laughs> you know, real, real characters like that, you know, yeah. just great people. And I found it really inspiring and, and got a lot of songs out of it. You know, looking back, on yeah. it now, I got a lot of, a lot of inspiration from it. I think when you grow up in a blue collar manner, cause I grew up like that. There's, oh, there is something about that. That is really important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and not to say, Hey, listen, that if somebody didn't grow up Elliot and they had it better, good, you know, they'd take anything away, but there is something about the resourcefulness that you have to develop out of that is fucking great. I think, you know, I think so. You know, and it builds humility too, as well is is a huge thing. Yes. And being appreciative of, of who you are, what you are and what you have and, and being respectful. You know, I think that, that goes, goes a long way. And, I, I don't, I, I can't abhor laziness. It doesn't work. Oh, for I'm, me, the, you know? I'm the same. It, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. I, you know, when I kick back, I'm, I'm fidgety. I'm, you know, I'm, that's just the way that I am. And I'm not gifted. I'm not a gifted guitar player. I'm not a gifted singer. And I knew that. No, I, knew I don't, that I, no, man, I got it. You're a gifted singer. No, you, I'm not simple. They just are, you know, you, you know, you know, and I, but, yeah. but I knew that I had to work at it. Yeah, and you, but if you I have, wanted, if, man. If I, if I wanted to compete, but I knew that I wasn't yeah. under no illusion. Like, yeah, I just need to, you know, get the tattoos and wear the right <laughs> clothes and throw a few shakes, and you know, I'll get up, I'll get up at you know four o'clock in the afternoon. I might write a song, but I might not. Yeah, I, I fucking hate all that bullshit. No, you know, yeah. you know. I mean, somebody like Springsteen is why why he's one of my heroes. The work ethic that guy yeah. has to still be as hungry as he is, you know, after all these years and all that success is is amazing because music is a gift and you should never be taken for granted and you should want to create and be if that's you have the chance to do that as your chosen profession that should be completely um embraced yeah man i agree yeah uh thank you that was very cool um when did you move to the states and what prompted you to move over here <laughs> I moved to the States. Officially, I moved at the beginning of 2005. Mm. Um, and it was love. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I met my wife. Um, um, it was a cool story how I met her. I, I, you know, I put out the second solo record through Sanctuary. Um, things were going great. I was on tour opening for Def Leppard, solo acoustic opening for Leopard, which is that's incredible. pretty fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was incredible. It took, it, was, it took me for a year all over the world. So wow. acoustic. And we played uh, at Irvine. The amphitheater I used to be at Irvine outside LA. And um, I just bought a house in Dublin. And I just moved into it. And things were great. And I was supposed to do some promo for the record label. And... I was feeling pretty hungover because I had a few drinks with Joe the night before. And I was kind of pissed off that the record label hadn't really done a great job. I mean, here I am with Def Leppard and I felt that they hadn't stepped up enough to, to, to make more of that. Yeah. And the guy who was kind of looking after me at the time said, you know, you, you're the, the person, the record company's here to sort of um, take you into LA to do the promo. And I was like, oh man, I said, I, you know, can we just blow it out? I said, I'm going back home tomorrow. They're, you know, we've toured the album. They really... I kind of pissed off, you know, they've not really put a lot of work into this. I feel a bit like down by them. He went, she's about five, eight, long hair, long blonde hair, wearing a kick ass pair of boots. I was like, give me five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and, and that was, that was my wife, Tina. And um, that's awesome. <laughs> so we went into LA and that was 2003. I went back to Ireland, thought nothing of it. You know, nothing happened. We hung out the show and, thought she was a really amazing, amazing um, woman. And 
I went back home and, and moved into my house. And then I came back over to play a show called the Hootenanny, which they used to have down Orange County every year. I was over playing a couple of LA shows with my band. I went into the label and there she was. And she's like, oh man, you know, I've been trying to contact you. you. And I said, well, I never got any emails. And it turned out she had the wrong email address. Long story short, we hit it off. Started seeing each other, which was very difficult when I lived in Dublin and she was in LA. But, you know, a lot of money, transatlantic flights, something I had to give. And I just went, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go back, sell the place. Like literally had six months. <laughs> I went back, went back, sold everything uh, and moved to LA, uh, literally with a bag of clothes. And, and, and that was it. And we got married in 2000, November, 2005. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. That's real. That's a nice Thank story, you. man. That's a good so 16, story. Six, 16 years this year and one, one daughter later. That's awesome. Really cool story, man. Thanks. Thank you. You cover, you're covering all the bases here. You're covering rags to riches, romance. <laughs> fuck <with> you. <laughs> you're you're going to accept me straight for a while here. Um, oh, that's man. a really nice story. I'm glad, man. That's really good to hear. Sorry. You, I mean, you know, I, I'm talking a lot, Craig, but the, I, the, none of this makes sense without any of the stories and the background behind it. Dude, it's your you interview. Know? I hope you talk a lot. If you don't talk Thanks, a lot, man. I'm fucked. Yeah. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh I want to ask you a couple of questions about Black Star Riders. I love the work you guys did, and I thank you. Yeah, it's I mean, real proper rock band, man. R yeah, rock, proper rock songs, guitars, vocals, boom. Yep. Um, can you talk about why you formed? And I hope this is the only question I'm asking you that you've asked a hundred times. Talk about why you formed the band rather than continuing along as like the then reformed Thin Lizzy. And is there going to be any more Black Star Riders in the future? I'll answer the last question first. Yes, we're already, the fifth album's written. We're going in in October to record it here in LA. That's fucking great to hear, man. You know, we everything got put on hold because of the pandemic. We put out another Steady Grace at the end of 2019, We, which was our fourth record. We got one tour of Europe in, and then boom, the world changed forever. And yeah. we were supposed to, all, all last year, we were supposed to be touring constantly. So, you know, there's no point in going back and trying to resurrect something that's been out two years. So we forged ahead, we wrote the next record, and we will go in with Jay Rustin, who, who produced the last record. Uh, it's already booked here in, here in L.A. Uh, the second two weeks of October. That's awesome. So, yeah. um, is, Album is, number five, yeah. Is Christian still in the band, or is another Christian is very Christian is very much still in the band, yeah. I just yeah. co-wrote a, co a lot of the songs with Christian. So Awesome. Yeah, he's a, he's a yeah. lovely guy, man. I, I like he's a him. great guy. Great player. Um, why we became Black Star Writers, we were doing the Lizzie thing and it was going extremely well. And you get into that bubble where, well, yeah, maybe we should do a song. And of course, everybody gets excited. And we were kind of waiting for Scott Gorham and Brian Downey to go, oh, we've got this idea or that idea. And Damon Johnson and I, being a thin Lizzie, nuts, fanatics we were, I went, they keep talking about writing a song, but they haven't, will we, will you and I write something and just take it to them and, and just see what they think just to get the ball rolling here? So we wrote Bound for Glory, Damon and I, and we took it to them. And, and Scott was all, Scott was a little bit lukewarm about it. He was like, eh, you know, but, but he always is. You got to remember, Scott Gorham's a guy that thought boys are back in town, shouldn't be a single. So, <laughs> Sorry, so I, I kind of said laugh. that to I kind of said that to him. I was like, man, yeah, I, I'm not sure about your judgment. When it comes to it. You know, Sorry, but Brian, but they really dug. We took it. No, it's cool. We took a couple ideas, and they really dug it. So we started writing some stuff with the idea we were going to. It was going to be a new Thin Lizzy album. So the interest around it is obviously huge from labels and and, and everybody else. And we get to, but we've written about eight songs at this point. Now, me personally, my head is going, this is fucking great. You're, it's the first Thin Lizzy album in 30 years, and your name's going to be on it. You've written, co-written the songs, and this is going to be fucking amazing. And my heart's going, what the fuck are you doing, Ricky? You're an idiot. This is sacrilege. This is your favorite band with Phil Line at your favorite rock and roller of all time. Yeah. You can't do this. Playing his songs live and keeping the memory and the spirit of those songs live is one thing. Recording without Phil, you know, so I've got this fucking conflict going on. And as we're getting more and more into it, I can sense that the other guys maybe have too. You just, uh, just pick okay. up on it. And 
we went into rehearsal one day and, and Scott sort of said, hey, guys, I, you know, I don't really know if we should be doing this. And I was like, thank fuck you said that. Oh, wow. So the damn and we opened. all went and we all went, man, you know, I said, we're all so conflicted. But we just sort of looked at each other and thought, again, playing Phil's songs and keeping that memory alive, but to record an album without Phil Phil Lynott, when that's never, but we obviously Phil's been on every Lizzie album, you know, sure. of course he has. That's taken it too far for the fans and for me personally as a fan too. And I, and we just went, we're not going to do this. And so we, we sort of went away. We told management, everybody was, no, we, we've had a rethink. This, this isn't the right thing to do. This is, this is wrong for so many different levels on so many different levels. And I'm sitting with Scott a couple of weeks after we said, I said, man, this is a real, it's a real shame, Scott. Um, that we've got all these great songs. Not a real shame when it was Cornel Lizzie because it was the absolute right thing to do. I said, we've got these great songs. I said, I've kind of written, you know, three or four more. I said, we've got an album's worth of really cool songs that nobody's going to get to hear. And we're, you know, we're having a drink, we're talking. I said, why, why don't we just come up with a band name and, and just put them out under a different under a different name and just so people. And Scott goes, that's, that's just, it's a pretty cool idea. So we went back to to the other guys and um, Brian Downey was just like, no, he said, man, he said, I, I'm, I don't want to be involved in, in, in starting something new and what that takes and the whole thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to step aside. Right. Guys go do it. I'm kind of done. Darren Wharton, one of the original Lizzie guys, keyboard player joined in the Chinatown album. But Darren was the same. He's got, I've got my own band there going on. He said, I'll, you know, so it left me, Marco, Scott and, and, uh, and Damon. Damon took a bit of convincing too as well. Damon was like, I don't want to know if, you know, start a whole new thing and go, th- you know, because we're, you know, guys in our late forties at that point. And sure. we'd all been through, through the mill a lot, but I persuaded Damon and Damon put us in touch with Jimmy DeGrasso. Jimmy DeGrasso came in, we got hooked up with Kevin Shirley, producer Kevin Shirley. And we went in and we knocked out all hell breaks loose. Came up, I came up with the name black star riders and we waited. We were like, anybody going to like this? Is anybody going to care? Is anybody going to be interested? Who knows? But at least we're going to get the songs out. And uh, we put the first album out. We started getting a lot of offers for shows. And it, the album did incredibly well. Yeah. And everybody, every, for the most people, seemed to really dig what we were doing. It felt right because we weren't, you know. You probably felt a lot of uh, unbridled was, shit, like weight off your shoulders. You know, it's hard enough. I mean, not in a good way. With the amazing burden of fronting Thin Lizzy life, hell yeah, and the, and the responsibility that comes with that. To have to suddenly have that make a new record, that would have been too much, I think, to to, to bear. Yeah, um, as a fan, as a as a rabid fan of Thin Lizzy that I am, for me personally, so it was absolutely the right decision. And then and the band just started, you know, gathering momentum. Suddenly, you know, we were in, in album number two, and you know, we didn't need to play half a dozen Thin Lizzy songs to pad out our set because we had enough Black Star Rider stuff and the people seemed to be not demanding the Lizzy stuff. Well, the music is great, fucking great. Which is, great. which is a great testimony to us, you know? Yeah. So, 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 you know, and here we are, you know, nine years in about to make album number five. So it's incredible. That's awesome, man. I'm so happy there's another one coming out. That's really good to hear. Thank man. you. Uh, I want to talk about some of the music you've made, including your new record, When Life Was Hard and Fast. I don't usually ask about titles, but you have some pretty cool titles in your catalog. Uh, Love many, trust few. <laughs> <laughs> that was something my old man used to say to me all the time. Love many, trust few, always paddle your own canoe. And I just like, that's great. That's an album yeah, title that, right there. That yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah. That is good, man. Uh, and then when life was hard and fast, was it, what was any significance of that? Yeah. I co-wrote that song. I've written a lot of, excuse me, solo songs with a good buddy of mine from Belfast called Sam Robinson. Sam and I are the same age. Um, Sam's a great writer. He, he's written a couple of books and he's a great poet and a great writer and a great artist as well. And we, we grew up together, this is, which is the first line of the song. We grew up together along a rain lash road. It's always fucking raining in Ireland. And we wrote, about, we wrote about me and him being kids growing up you know, on the outskirts of Belfast and what our life was like. That's and so what cool. It was like, what it was like pre-internet, pre-cell phones, where you went out the door at eight o'clock in the morning and you played miles away from home and got dirty and got into fights and you didn't bitch or yell or you just, and you came back home when your tea was ready at seven o'clock at night. And 
and th- that innocence that you had back yeah. then, um, that we had when we were kids growing up in Belfast with everything going on, and the, and then the dreams that we had about being, you know, rock and rollers. I mean, there's a great. I love one of the lines in the song. One of the lines in the song is, um, um, "I can see the road ahead. It's tough. How are you going to keep me working on this farm?" Oh. When I can see when I when I can see the road ahead, it's tattooed on my arm. Oh you know, man, loads of metaphors and similes you know, in there, so, man. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty and, fucking and, cool. And that was that was my my hopes and dreams because I was, you know what, like I we talked earlier while I was standing there shoveling shit, I was dreaming about you know being on stage somewhere and, and playing to thousands of people. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, from I have a from. Love many, trust few. You got a song on there called uh, "Lonely Moon." Beautiful, really pretty ballad with a great guitar opening and a, and a really nice soul solo in the middle. I was curious. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely song. Um, is there a backstory to that song? And was that you playing solo in that? No, I wish it was. That's Vivian Campbell playing the guitar solo. Oh man, that that's <laughs> yeah, that sounded Def amazing. Leopard. Yeah, from Def Leppard. And um, Viv, Viv's a good friend, another fellow Irish man. Um, yes. Yeah, that song was written in Nashville with a, a great Nashville writer called Rob Crosby. Him and I co-wrote that together. Rob Crosby wrote um, "Concrete Angel," which was a big hit for Martina McBride. Okay. Back in the day, and I went. To, I, I did the Nashville thing. I wanted to do it. I wanted to check it out, and I fucking hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, how do you really feel? What What What, what were you expecting it's a, to get it's out a, of it? It's a, fucking great town and it's it's I, you know i hated it because i hated the clickiness of the whole corporate music road thing yeah i get that and you know and not fitting in and even i even had somebody say to me well you know if you cover up your tattoos you might get more work at this time I was well, like, why the fuck would fucking, you want to do that what, what, is, what, what is it fucking 1872 you know what, what, what's you know what's going on here and i just find it very clicky i, I love the town yeah I have some great friends there I, and i met some great people but I found the whole songwriting thing. I, mean, I wrote with one guy. That, you know, he walked in, right? Okay, Irish. What are we going to write, Irish? Uh... Like, stop calling. Stop calling me Irish. <laughs> you know, my name's Ricky. <laughs> shit like that, and you know, and I just was like, this is this is bullshit. And well, maybe you're I remember, the first Irish person he's ever seen. <laughs> I, rem- I remember. I remember. I, I don't know. Fuck. I remember going somewhere, and I, they have a great thing called the, the Belfast Nashville Writers Workshop, and I was very honored to be a part of it. And every year. Nashville writers come over to Belfast. Belfast writers go to Nashville. It goes on for a week. There's gigs and there's workshops. And uh, there was this one kid who's since gone, I'm going to name his name because I don't want to be embarrassed. He won't be embarrassed, but I just don't want to name his name. He's since gone on to be a very successful songwriter. Amazing artist from Belfast. And he's in Nashville for the first time. And he's, you know, wide eyed and bushy tail and soaking it in. And we get taken to meet some, some, some woman had written the theme tune for General Hospital. This soap opera was on the stage, right. and that was fair play. She, you know, that had paid for everything in her life. That's absolutely, amazing. yeah. She starts lecturing on how to write songs. Yeah, this is how you write a song. You need a metaphor. You need this and that. Follow <laughs> blah blah blah. And I got halfway through, and I just went, "All due respect, mom, this bullshit. There's no <laughs> rules. To, there's no rules to how you. Because he he's nudging me, going, well, that's not how I write.' And I said, "That's." Just wait a minute, you know? I just went, you can't lecture on how to write a fucking song. I said, you just write what you feel. And if it's right for you, then it's right. So that pissed me off. <laughs> Good for you, man. You see, you see, I'm, I'm liking you more. This is the angry guy you know you're talking about. Coming no, out. no, no. You this is like, out. I'm liking you um, more and more because like, who, and I just fucking I, real. I ain't, I ain't playing that game, but I did write with some incredible writers. And some of those writers like Rob Crosby, were were the outlaw guys? They were the guys that were you know friends with Steve Earle and Merle Haggard and and um, you know th- those to me are the real country. Well and Jennings, those are the real country. Johnny Cash, obviously, the real deal. Sure. You know, I wanted to go there because my dad was a huge country fan, but my dad was a Jim Reeves, Patsy Klein, okay. Johnny Cash. You know, that was the real when I used to play those records when I was a kid. So that was my first real taste of music. Um. So parts of that whole thing left me disappointed. Sure. And parts of it, parts of it were were extremely inspiring. The songs that I that I actually co wrote with some people there. But it, I had no urge to go. This is it. I'm going to relocate here. I'm going to be blah blah blah. I just thought, you know what? They don't like me, and I don't fit in, and that's okay. Yeah, I get it. That's okay. I, you know? I totally get it. 
yeah. yeah any place where they're saying maybe if you should change your tattoos i mean like you're but a great i mean listen a great city and I'm yes not, like I, I, don't, I don't want to say it because i do love the city and and my bro damon johnson lives there now and, and yeah and you know it, it, and i love going there and hanging out i just didn't want to play the corporate yeah country music game yeah. i wasn't it wasn't for me and i could smell bullshit yeah i could smell like i could smell a clothes shop you know Good for you, man. I'm glad you did that. Yeah, this, I, I have tons of love. I don't. I have no idea what a closed shop smells like, but I can smell one. Well, wow, it's just <laughs> bullshit, is what you can smell, you know. But you could smell when when it's not a fit, and when you've got to like adapt to. Yeah. Like you said, you know, how can you give lectures on writing a song? I mean, you know, ask. You uh, can talk about why you wrote songs and what inspires you, but I don't think you can teach somebody because there should be no rules if like I, like I said if you write a song and you feel good about it and you feel it's coming from the heart and you're right and then it's right yeah Who totally. am I? Who's, who's, who's anybody to say well that's wrong and you didn't write how that's insulting yeah 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 you know? it you is know? a little condescending yeah i totally yeah. get it man uh another great song from uh, another state of grace soldier in the ghetto that's that's my favorite black star writers album you got a lyric in there which is kind of like alludes to what you're just talking to don't define by self don't define yourself by what you are define yourself by what you love and i thought it's such a great song it's such a tough Thank song you. um you know it's one of those things it's like kind of rocky you listen to it before you need to get pumped up sort of you know uh yeah. tell me about the backstory to that song i am a huge um soul music fan i'm a huge motown fan i'm a huge northern soul fan I'm a huge Nile Rogers fan. That guitar riff was me trying to be Nile Rogers, wishing I could be Nile Rogers and be as good as that opening guitar funk riff. Um, I love Nile Rogers. I love everything he's done. Um, and then marrying that with the the, the power and the, the hard rock of Black Star Riders, I'm wanting to sing a lyric um, for the common person about, you know being walked all over by our government and how we are and having to fight for education, to fight for healthcare, fight just to put food on the table and um, just really fight for equal rights and, and opportunities and just fight to be heard in a world that's just vastly disappearing up its own fucking arsehole. Yeah. And a big inspiration for that song was Curtis Mayfield. Right on, man. You know, you know, you know, move on up was, was a huge inspiration for, for, for that song. Great song. And, and I'm, you know, I, I, I'll wear my influences on my sleeve and, and I, I love Curtis Mayfield. And I wanted to write something that was inspiring to me as move on up is to me. I wanted to have that feel with that funk guitar start and, and then marry it with the whole black star writers, big power chord sort of crashing chorus. Great. I'm great, glad you picked up song. on that. It's one of, one of my favorite songs as well. And then we had the great Fred Mandel play, um, play keyboards on it. Fred, Fred's played with queen and Elton John and he came in and played a, uh, some wonderful keyboards on it. Great, great track. The whole whole record is fantastic. Um, all right. When Life is Hard and Fast, it's your latest. Man, 21 songs. Yeah, yeah but, <laughs> but I mean, you know, 10 of them are cover versions. They don't but count. still, man, who puts out fucking 21 songs on a record now, man? You got that's, my that. second, that's my second. That's my second. My, my, my previous solo album when Patsy Cline was crazy and Guy Mitchell sang the blues. It was a very snappy title. That was... That, <laughs> That was a double album as well. Twenty-two songs. All was original. it? Nobody one was puts, one, nobody one side was one album was electric and one was acoustic. That's so cool, man. I mean, talk about work ethic. That was uh, pretty impressive. So you had eleven originals, ten covers, and they were covers of hits you didn't think you'd be covering. Um, what was different about this record for you? I know Keith Nelson co-wrote a lot of the songs with you. Yeah, and he produced it. How was his role? How did his role as a producer influence that record? And what was different about the record for you? Um, well, meeting Keith and working with Keith was obviously when, you know, you're working with a different person, they're bringing their energy and their knowledge and their experience. So I hadn't worked with Keith before. So that was complete new beginnings for both of us. Um, a, 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 an instant kinship right out of the gate. You know, I would bring my ideas into Keith and he would, understand them and, and recognize where I wanted to go with them and help me achieve that mm. within the songs. Um, and we had, a, we just had a great time. You, you obviously, you know, Keith real well. He's, he's such a, he's, he's one of us. He's again, yeah. you know, a blue collar, blue collar, blue straight up yeah. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania guy, no bullshit, you know, a spade to spade. And, 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 you know, it was great working with him. 
um, because we had a blast. And for a lot of the time, it was just me and him in the oh, studio. Oh, that's cool. To, together, you know, once we got the, the band in and got the basic backing tracks down, it was really just myself and Keith working on all the guitars and then, you know, obviously me doing the vocals. Um, I just found it real easy, you know, I, I, and Keith got it. Keith got what I was trying to do. He got the songs and he got the ideas and he got the production. He got the sounds that we were after in the studio. And when you have that, it's easy. It's yeah. really easy, you know, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it was a lot of fun. It sounds like you had a lot of fun on there, man. It's, in fact, there's a couple of songs uh, I'll ask you about in a minute, but uh, first let's start with clown of misery. I love the vibe on that <laughs> one, man. It's just you and an acoustic, but how did you, it sounds like it's coming out of like an old radio from the thirties. Right. Where, did, where right. did that idea come from? And how, how do you, how do you create that sound? That was pretty cool. That, that's, that's an iPhone. That's the iPhone demo of the song. That's Are you me, kidding like, me? That's the iPhone demo of the song. I wrote the song. Oh my God. And like I do, with, like I do with everything I write, I, I'm not that much, you know, garage bands about my limit, but what I, what I hate about sometimes setting things up and get, I'm like, fuck it, just sing it into my iPhone and get it done and get, capture the idea. So I sang the song into the iPhone, sent it to Keith and went, I think we should record this. And, uh, I think this could be really cool. And he hit me back in when it's done. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's done, bro. It's like, this is a fucking, this is an iPhone recording, bro. We got to, you know, we can do it a little bit. We can do, we can do a little bit better than that. With, with the fuck all you the talking great about? Stuff you've got in the studio, you know? He's like, man, he said, he's like, I, like you just said, he said, I love the energy of it. I yeah. love the vibe of it. And, and there's a desperation. He said, I don't think we could, we should mess with that. He said, why don't we make it distorted like an old Hank Williams 78, you know, yes. from, from, from the forties. And that's what we did. So we ran it through an effect to give it that crackly sort of old timey 78 yeah. RPM record feel. Cheapest song I ever, ever recorded and will ever record. <laughs> it's a great track, man. I Thank love you. the vibe on that. Thank you. Uh, and the same thing with You're My Rock and Roll. It was, I just have one word. Awesome. I love how this starts you. out. You're calling Keith. Rock and rolling, baby. It's just lost. It's mystery. <laughs> and it is like a, a really hard rockabilly song. Um, yeah. I, some of your lyrics, are you a blessing? Are you a curse? Are you Keith Richards in reverse? I mean, it's just like such a cool, <laughs> what, tell, tell me about that one, man. That was so cool. We just wanted, I wanted to write a bombastic, you know, cheesy rock and roll anthem about how much I love rock and roll and all the great things that it's done for me in my life, you know, since I was six years old. Yeah, with a nod to you know, and we wanted a little bit of glam rock in there, hence sort of drum, the drum sort of shuffle at the start. Keith and mm -hmm. I are big, are big fan of that, and just about the blessing of of the and, and how amazing rock and roll is. Yeah, it's a celebration of all things rock and roll. It's as simple as that, you know. And I think that line is sort of again, it, it's a nod to people that put the work in. You know, and there's a lot of like a lot of people, you know, have the look and have the poses and throw the shapes and there's no substance there. It's the people that want thinking that I got to go out and do all this and get wasted and do that. And it's all about the songs, you know, yeah, I think that's the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Keith Richards has all that, but you know what? He writes fucking killer fucking songs. Yeah. Totally, you know? man. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what the real sort of meaning behind that sort of phrase is in the song. It's like, you know, yeah, it's good to look fucking like a rock star because you should. Yeah. You know, that's the reason I got into it because when I watched, rock and rollers when i was a kid they were like aliens to me i was like well, why do these people look like that how can i look like that why do they, are they from this planet <laughs> that's that's very much a part of it but they had the songs to back all of that up yeah well it's a lovely yeah. it is a great homage to rock and roll man and i love uh, Keith, keith's solo in the middle there is great oh well. what a guitar player tore it up. he's just the best yeah, yeah tore just it up. the best do you have a favorite song on the record um Probably the, the most personal one is Time Don't Seem to Matter because I'm, I'm duetting with my daughter on there. I am. Um, so, you you, you, you just broke song. up. You're duetting Sorry, with... I, my, my daughter Pepper. Oh, really? It's, 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 I, wrote the song about, I wrote the song for her, about her, and she, she, du, she duets on that song with me. That's cool, man. Which, which was amazing. So... Was no reason. That's um, probably. Um, I think Fighting Heart. You know, if I had to pick what, a rock one, one of the hard would Fighting Heart because it's one of the first songs that Keith and I worked on. It was the first song Keith and I worked on, and I remember taking the demo of it away and going, "Wow, we're really onto something here." So I think for that reason, that one as well. Well, and I would imagine you're pretty critical of your own stuff. So if you're feeling good about it, that's a really fucking good sign. 
Yeah, I, I am, but I'm. I, I've learned to walk away as well. I've learned that you're capturing an album for me is capturing a moment and capturing where you're at, your life and how you're feeling and and what's going on around you at that moment in time. And I've learned not to sort of analyze it and keep going back and picking at it. And you know, I'm, I'm very much if it feels good and and you get chills the first time you hear it, it's done. That's awesome, man. Is it? Are, are you, leave it. Leave it alone. Are you going to be touring that? Or I know it's. It, you know, it's released a little bit. What I'm is trying, I'm trying, you know, I've got a couple of shows booked in the UK over the summer. I don't know if they're going to go ahead. I've already moved one full European tour into the start of 2022. If restrictions keep lifting here in the States as they are, I'm hoping I can get some shows in the States before the end of the year. Hmm. At the mercy of the pandemic, you know, yeah. it keeps changing, as, as you know, every week. Yeah. You can do this, you can't do that. The state's okay, that state's okay. We can't get insured. You know, it's just... It's it's weird. It's a weird time. Totally. Uh, top three experiences you've had musically. I know you've had tons. Just oh, knee jerk reaction. Um, getting getting first major record deal, opening for David Bowie uh, in front of the Reichstag. Um, getting to sing for Thin Lizzy. That's awesome. Yeah, opening for Bowie, eighty five thousand people. You're six days early. You're plowing a few. That's right. one of, it's one of the best ones I've heard. Yeah, man. That's, <laughs> that's tough to beat, man. Thanks. Man. Uh, guitar wise, what's your what's your primary guitar you play right now, and what other two guitars round out your top three? It used to be, you know, it still is Gibson's. Um, I the, when we first got our money from our first major record deal when I was in the Almighty. I went into the music store in Glasgow and bought a white Les Paul Gibson custom guitar because Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols and Steve <laughs> Clark from Def, Le Def Leppard yeah. had that guitar. And that's the reason I bought it. I still have that guitar to Do this you? day. And I still, I still use it. It's now a very cool nicotine yellow. <laughs> so, and it looks fucking great. And I still have that and I still use it. And I have you know a couple of really nice uh, Gibson um, SGs as well. Um, but the last four years I've been with Gretsch um, and they've been amazing with me and I have a bunch of really cool Gretsch guitars um, that I use. I've got um, um, a Gretsch Broadcaster which which I use a lot from the solo stuff and then even with Black Star Riders now I'm using the Gretsch Power Jets um, um, and I've always loved Gretsch guitars so it's great to be, be endorsed by them now and, and like I said the company's been wonderful with me um, but top three, number one would be the, the, the Gibson Les Paul. Is that um, way a ton? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I, it's funny. I, I'm, you know, I, I can't get through a whole show with it because it, it'll give me a slow back. You know, oh, hell yeah. the Gretches are much lighter. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. so that would, that would be number one. My Gretsch broadcaster, number two. And then I have an acoustic called the Navalon, which is a hand built acoustic, which was made in my hometown of Newton Arts in, in Ireland. Wow. I have. And uh, I love that guitar very, very much. I've wrote, written, I, I retired it from the road because it's starting to get so beat up. It was just, I, I was, and it's it's a very expensive guitar. I was just like, you know, I think you'd really write full stuff on that guitar. Kind of funny. It's made in, in your hometown. Sorry, I lost you. I, I, so it's kind of funny. That, we yeah, we freeze. froze from it. Yeah, yeah, just for a sec. Yeah, we can't believe we, we we've made it all this way. I know. <laughs> so it's an Avalon guitar, Avalon guitar, and it's an acoustic made in my hometown, and I, I've written and still do write pretty much everything on it. Very cool, man. Uh, what's the last thing you listened to musically before this? What were you listening to? The last thing I listened to would be last night with my wife. I listened to a, a UK band called Sleaford Mods. Spell that Sleaf. E A, yeah. S L E A F O R D S. Sleaf Sleaford. Yeah. The S E S L E A F O R D. I'm sorry. Sleaford mods. Yeah. Separate word. M O D S. I have to check that out. What is, is that like? Like uh, what? Is, what is that like? It's UK punk rock street rap. Okay, that's cool. That's the only way I can really describe it. Do you watch Brit Box, man? No. Oh, you don't? Do you know what Brit? Brit we've we yeah. watched we watch Brit Box. I never watch an American TV because of my wife. We got I watch Box. a lot. I still watch a lot of UK shows, but I, I get them on BBC sort of America. We have Brit Box, and I, you know, I, I get them on Netflix and 
Yeah. All those other places, you know. Yeah. Uh, Ricky, funniest thing or most embarrassing thing that's happened to you on stage or in the studio? I mean, most embarrassing thing I think is I remember when Steel Almighty, I went up on the up on the drum mm -hmm. riser and I went to do this jump, you know, full on Pete Townsend jump off the drum riser and my right leg it got tangled around one of the drum mic cables and I, oh. I jumped. I, man I managed to pull pretty much all of the drum kit and myself, boom. Oh, fuck. So it wasn't a case of I could just pick myself up and carry on. It was, our drummer's drums were all over the floor as well. We had to stop the show, rebuild the kit, and yeah. That's good. Hey, man, um, you don't fuck around. Funniest thing, we, we were, the first Almighty album we recorded, we recorded it in Abbey Road. Oh, Studio wow. Two. Shit. Studio 2, where, where the Beatles did all, the, all this stuff. So that was huge. And I was doing a vocal take. And if ever you've seen Studio 2 in the documentaries, there's a huge live room, and the control room is up at the top of top of the staircase so it's very detached from the live room so i'm in this huge live room and it's you get the candles it's night you know i'm pretty stoned and i'm doing this vocal and i've got the headphones on and i'm i'm, I'm hearing imagined by john lennon the headphones i'm going i'm going, guys are you fucking hearing this this is freaking me out and they're all like oh no we can we can't hear anything what are you talking about I said, i'm sure i can hear john lennon and they're like, ah, you know, really, you're high, man. Don't, don't, don't have some huh. So we do another take, and they're just way off in the distance. I keep hearing, you know, imagine there's no. I'm like, guys, fucking hell. I said, fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. This is freaking me out. I run up the stairs, open the door. And of course, they just start fucking pissing themselves <laughs> laughing. You know, the engineer's been sending a little yeah. feed down the head, and you, you know. <laughs> uh, and you were stoned that was perfect and i was completely <laughs> hook, hook line and sinker i'm like it's haunted we need to get out of here oh that's you know? classic that's great man yeah. top top three desert island discs just for this minute. um black rose thin lizzie um mc5 kick out the jams stiff little fingers and inflammable inflammable material nice tell me uh tell me one what one thing are you proudest or most grateful for doing or not doing both in your professional life and in your personal life? Um, personal life, you know, being a dad, my kids, it's the thing I'm most proud of. Um, and professional life, um, not giving up. Right on, man. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I think a lot of people are happy about that. Uh, tough question. Tell me what you like most about yourself, Ricky. <laughs> uh, uh, can, this everything grinds to a halt on this question usually <laughs> I, I i think I, I think my level of tolerance is something i'm most proud of you know i, I think i think i'm a pretty tolerant person and and um i think that's a, a good thing i don't fly off the handle too easily. i'm quite meticulous in in dealing with, with problems and stuff like that and i think that's that's hopefully a good trait yeah, we always like that, or it was just like later on. Um, I think later on in life, I think in my twenties, I was I was very a very different person. Um, mm -hmm. you know, very a lot more arrogant, and you know, a lot more headstrong. I, I was always I was always brought up to be polite and have good manners, and, and that's always been part of my my DNA, and I, I still really believe in that. Um, because I think that goes a long way oh, in everything, everything, especially everything nowadays. In, good everything, in, everything in life and, and and respect. I've always had that, but I was definitely arrogant and, and would fly off the handle more easily. And like I said, we talked about it. Blame a lot of other people for for things that were within my control. Yeah, you know, when I learned to to change that, that's when things infinitely started getting better for me. Funny how that works, right? Yeah, isn't it, man? <laughs> Funny, yeah. it, for sure. Uh, something or someone you miss from your childhood? My childhood? Um, I mean, it's it's easier to say in later life because that's when you start to lose people as you get older, obviously, that mean, that mean more to you. I think I miss living in Northern Ireland. Really? Yeah. Think you'd ever go back? I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I go. You know, before we had the pandemic, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'll be back three or four times a year. I still have a lot of family there, and I would go back at any excuse. And we, my family, we'd go over and we'd spend Christmas and stuff over there. So it's still very much a part of me. Um, but yeah, I think I miss, 
and I will go back and drive around where I grew up and where I played and all that. I do that every time I go back. I do that. So obviously, it's still a huge um, lure for me to. Yeah, it's part of me. Part of me that can't let that go. I don't. Not that I ever want to. So I think that's what I miss. That's cool. Do you still have family in yeah. Scotland, or are they all back in Ireland? No, I've my, both my sisters live in Scotland. Oh, they okay, cool. Both 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 married Scottish guys. So, yeah. It's funny when you said that when you first moved uh, when you first moved there that they were making fun of your accent because like Scottish, I, I, I can understand a road <laughs> man when something from Scotland comes on TV. I yeah. have a heart, depending upon the, where. Yeah, west of Scotland accent, something else, man. It's it's full on. They have a they have a slang word for every word. Yeah, yeah. and then if they ever try to show you like the language, like when you. You know, it's like yeah. all, it's very, very difficult. I don't understand yeah. any of it, man. Yeah. Uh, most important thing your dad taught you? Um, humility. How about your mom? Most important thing she taught you? <laughs> and inadvertently, she taught me to, to, um, to grab life as hard as you can because she didn't and um and i i learned that my mom was a very scared person and was very scared of of everything and was always sadly sort of was uh, everything it was always bad you know it's, uh, be careful and you know and because she loved me and that, and that was great but she was afraid to live and I, and, and I, I looked at her and I went, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want that to be the way that I live. Yeah. Thank you, man. That was yeah. kind of you to share that. Yeah. yeah. That no, good. you're welcome. Uh, any hobbies outside of music? Soccer. I'm actually missing the FA cup final to do it. I, I was like, man, I fucking told them we should Saturday. And I was in the Tina's during the FA cup final. I'm going to miss the second half. And, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> it's not, bro, but this is, <laughs> this is more important. This is more important. I am a, so, I, I'm a soccer fanatic. Fanatic. Yeah. I will watch any soccer game. Man. So what do you yeah. think's going on with, you know, cause the guys who own man, you that's Tampa here. Yeah. They own the Tampa Bay Bucks. Well, so I, I think, I, you know, they, Soccer is a working class sport in the UK and it means everything to the people. Yeah. Most of them, a lot of families are passionate about it. All their money goes on it and they travel a team everywhere and that's their one relief, a release that that takes them out of, you know, maybe a job they don't like or, 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 or a situation they're in. So they're passionate about it. And when people come in throwing money around and, 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 and don't ask the fans what they think and what's right, that's when you get problems. Yeah. And I think you get you get a lot of people from different countries, not just America. A lot of these clubs are owned by, you know, Chinese businessmen or, or people from the Middle East. They don't care about the fans. They look at the TV money and the advertising. But at the end of the day, you're it's like music. You're nothing without your fans. You're football yeah. without your fans. It's the same in football. And I think that needs to be addressed. They've addressed it in Germany brilliantly, where the the fans. Um, get a, a stakeholder in, in the club and they keep their season tickets at a, a, a good cap on their season tickets That's and the fans get, vote, get get votes and how the clubs run the clubs are run over there it's the way it should be oh my fans god the talk about the tying life, somebody life, to your yeah. club holy shit they're the, they're the lifeblood of 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 music and and, uh, and soccer are the fans in my opinion yeah. you know that's a really good point yeah, yeah. Man. so soccer is your thing outside of music yeah. uh two more questions man um, of course. Most important lesson life has taught you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's like I said before is is to keep on never to give up, just to stay strong. Um, and you know, and um, you know, be try and be a, try and be a good person. Try and respect others, and respect yourself, and respect others. You know. And biggest change in your personality, Ricky, over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is a natural part of aging? Um, I think I've changed a lot in the last 10 years. I think some of it's the bullshit detector that increases as you get older and you don't suffer fools. I've never suffered fools, but I definitely don't suffer them at all anymore. Good. Um, I, I, I've learned to say no. I'm okay yeah. to say no. I'm going to say no. I'm not doing that. No, I don't want to do that. You know, and it doesn't bother me in the slightest. And, uh, I think that's, you know, and just to, to, to enjoy life, enjoy the time that we have here. I mean, I think even in the last year, I think 
anybody that's not really been affected by what we've all gone through and realized how precious life is and how short time is, um, you know, how can you not be? You know? Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent on that, man. Yeah. Uh, man, any final words before I close this out? Tell people thank you. Where to find it's a blast. You. No, man. Thank you. Sa- Saturday, Saturday, Saturday morning therapy session. You can't <laughs> Uh, man, honestly, thank you so much for everything. I really, you're a lovely, lovely, lovely guy, man. I hope to God you play down here because it'd be great to see you in person and say hello. Uh, Me too. I just want to play anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) On that note. Um, so let me tell you what Ricky's got going. First of all, go to Ricky's website. It's rickywarwick.com, but it's W-A-R-W-I-C-K, even though it's pronounced like Warwick, uh, Ricky Warwick, R-I-C-K-Y Warwick, W-A-R-W-I-C-K. The new record is when life was hard and fast, but man, I would love you to go back and check out all the black star writer stuff. If you like rock and roll, I mean, it's, it's happening, man. This is the band you want to be listening to. Every one of the records are great. And I'm really excited to know that there's another one coming out. Also on June 19th, uh, Ricky is having a live stream. Talk about that. What's going on? Where do people find it and all that good stuff? Yeah. I've, I've been doing these, you know, I guess it's my 10th one I've done in the last year. So, you know, every couple of months or, uh, and I try and change it up every show. So it's a live stream online stream. It's acoustic. It's from my, it's from my home. Um, it's great. I mean, we've put a lot of work into it. It's not just me sitting on a stool singing on my computer. We have, we have a little, my wife's amazing. She's got the technical side of it, set up cameras and different angles. It's, it's, it's a good show. It's online. Obviously it's not the same as live thing. This one is going to be songs from the almighty only. So I'm playing all oh, my cool. tunes in this one. Yeah. Um, it's only five bucks. You go to stage Type in Ricky Warwick, it'll come up. You can buy you buy yourself a ticket on there. It's five bucks, um, and that gets you in, and you're and then you're good to rock and roll. What's the website stage? Stage it s t a g e i t stage it great dot com. Go to stage it.com and look up Ricky Warwick again w a r w i c k and uh, sign up for the live stream on the nineteenth. And let me tell you, man this man brings the work ethic and no yeah. bullshit. I don't want to sound like I'm blowing smoke up your ass. He's a fucking really hard worker. And I have a lot of respect for him for that. And what he's done over his 40. Like when I was, that, when you said that, it sounded like you're 110 years old. That's what I thought when I was reading, I'm like, Holy I know. shit. <laughs> I know, man. But Hey, but that's a tribute to all the shit you do, man. So congratulations Thank and thanks for everything, man. And I, I can't wait. I hope to see you on the road sometime and congratulations with everything. And so many good Thank stories, you. man. I don't even know where to start here. Thanks. I'm done with music. You can't kid yourself. This is like, I'm going to have quotes. Uh, I have quotes here forever, man. I, when, when my merch store comes out, we have Ricky Warwick t-shirt quotes. <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, anything else you want to promote or anything else? Like, any other way to support No, you? just, just thank you. And, you know, thanks everybody for, for, for their support out there, you know, cause the, you know, guys, are the reason I get to do what I do and uh, you know, let's just, uh, let's just keep on keeping on. Right on brother. Hang on one second to wrap this up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Ricky Warwick. Again, go to rickywarwick.com, W-A-R-W-I-C-K. Please check out the new record, When Life Was Hard and Fast, and also look forward to the new Black Star Writers records. June 19th is a live broadcast. Go to stageit, S-T-A-G-E-I-T.com, and look for Ricky Warwick and sign up and... Um, Thanks for spending time with us, Ricky. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play a guitar and have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Brother, thank you for everything. Thank you.